So in this lecture, we're going to go over various concepts related to file statistics, or the FSTAT and LSTAT calls that uh, give us um, file metadata, uh, and uh, various other things like how to traverse directories uh, from a C program. And all of that will be um, illustrated with an example program I've built that it mimics the uh, built-in ls command, which is also, by the way, a C program. Uh, and to show you what I mean by that, I have here a, uh, a session where I will do a um, ls, uh, just to see what we've got in there. Okay, a handful of files. Uh, here's an ls long listing. Uh, recall that this does things like uh, permissions and all. Also uh, indicates when then something is a directory. Uh, sample is evidently a directory. Um, see what else we got in here. Um, we could do a dash a option that lists even files beginning with a, a period. Uh, and then uh, the final of the three, there are a great many LS uh, options, but the, of the three that we will actually do, the final one is a capital R that does a recursive list uh, showing the subcontents of any directories that are in the original LS list sample in our case here. Now, my program is called Alt LS, and that's the one we'll look at the code for. So running that briefly here. Uh, it does not do exactly the same thing as LS. It didn't bother to columnarize the files. That's a lot of uh, coding nuisance that we don't need to get into in this example. So they just list one per line. But I do have the dash L option. Again, that's not LS there. That's my program running. Uh, dash A option to show all the dot files. And even dash R. Now we may as well throw in an L while we're at it. Uh, to show the recursive list. I did the recursion a little differently from the standard... Uh, ls in that I show the directory in question and then uh, indented beneath it are the files within it uh, like that. Yeah. By the way, um, ls and alt ls allow you to list a target file directly if you want to do an ls on just one particular file. So maybe a dash l on, uh, oh, maybe just the source file for this program, alt ls.c. And that one particular file will be done by ls. And the same goes for Alt ls. So we can, in our command line arguments, have dash arguments that will be followed by letters uh, indicating uh, test flags of one form or another, or options flags, uh, and also just direct file names or directory names, which are to be ls specifically. About 100 lines of code then accomplishes that in alt ls.c, and let's take a look at those. So um, we'll be uh, starting with a loop here to process command line arguments and look at that in more detail in a minute with a couple in lecture questions. Uh, but a little bit of backdrop on that first. Uh, there is an options type I'll be using, uh, which I declared near the top of the file. And all that is is a simple struct with uh, three Boolean, integer Boolean uh, flags to show whether we're doing a long listing, and that's the full flag for the dash L. Uh, all files, including dot files, uh, that's the dash a option, and then recurse uh, for the dash capital R. So we'll set an options struct appropriately based on what our command line arguments say, uh, initialize one to all false to begin with, and then walk through the command line arguments and look for ones that begin with a dash and then pick up the letters after the dash and set options flags appropriately. Now let's do a little digression here and look at uh, the command line argument processing. That's not specifically related to ls, but it's, it's very common to Unix text utilities like ls or cat or what have you, very, very similar code in all of them. One pattern you'll see very often in argument command line processing is, is this thing here, argc minus minus comma argv plus plus. Now that's an in lecture question. What the heck does that do? Reason out using your knowledge of argc and argv, and remember that a comma glues together two expressions into one single expression, both of which will be performed. Coming back from a, from a pause on that, what you should come up with is that this will advance argv past the first command line argument and reduce the count of arguments correspondingly, so in effect it throws away the first command line argument, whichever one is pointed to by argv. And that makes sense because? Uh, because the first command line argument is the name of the command, and you usually don't worry about processing alt ls as a command line argument. It's the ones that follow it that you want. So we start by throwing away the first one. And then, by the way, every time we go through a command line argument, we throw it away as the iterator for the for loop. No harm in moving argv down through the 
pointers. Uh, once I'm done with my command line arguments, I have no need for them again. So we can be a little destructive here. We'll keep going as long as argc is, of course, non-zero. Now, we're going to save the actual character pointer by dereferencing argv and putting the result in arg. And then we'll walk that character pointer down the command line argument. And the first test we're going to make is whether it begins with a dash. Uh, be sure you follow. Again, the reasoning there, argv plus, or arg plus plus advances it, but it's a post increment, so we're dereferencing the original arg value, thus the first letter in the string. If it is equal to dash, then we're going to go through this while loop here. And that while loop will repeatedly do flag equals star arg plus plus. And again, a quick in lecture question there, just to be sure we're all awake and remembering string manipulation. Why is that a single equals? Why is that a single equals? And coming back from a pause, well, it's a little bit like the single equals in stir copy. What this is doing is copying each successive letter in arg over into flag. And that's going to be true as long as the letter copied is not the ASCII null at the end of the command line argument. So we're walking through all the letters up to the null. And in each case, we'll just test to see if it is A or L or capital R. And if so, we will OR in the current value of OPSOL uh, into uh, OPSOL. And uh, so if this is true, uh, we'll have OPSOL become true. And a little third in lecture question, just again, keeping awake here with basic C logic. Uh, what am I doing with this ops all or or? Why do I need to do that? And when would it ever matter? And the answer is, well, as I test each flag, um, I don't want to um, turn off ops all if it is already turned on. So I need to um, um, keep it true if it is already true. If I took the ops all or away, then if flag was equal to L in some later command line, uh, it would turn all off uh, instead of leaving it on. So once on, always on is the idea there. Now, there is an alternate possibility down here. This is uh, without the dash. And in that case, that means that uh, we have a file name as a command line argument, like uh, the case where I listed alt ls dot c specifically as the uh, command line argument uh, right there, for instance. And in those cases, we want to directly list the content or the metadata, I guess we should say, for that file. And our list function we'll be looking at does that. Uh, and we'll look at the parameters for it a little more closely in a bit. We keep track of how many such arguments we see because if we don't see any of them after the for loop, then we need to, at the very least, do a list for the current directory. And that is, of course, always dot. So one way or another, we're going to do either list calls based on command line arguments or a kind of default list call with the current directory. Now, the other parameters, obviously the middle one is the name of the file or directory to list information about. Uh, the first one's an indent, and that will come into play only in the recursive cases, like uh, here in our output where we had uh, indentation. Uh, for now, it'll be zero. Uh, and then the other is, of course, the ops that we just built so that the list command will or list function will know how to list things out correctly. Now list is right up here. And we have our parameters, indent and file name and opts. And the first thing we're going to do is an LSTAT call on the file name to get metadata. And you should remember that from earlier lectures. Uh, I believe it was an in-lecture question to research it. It's a cousin to FSTAT. It uh, takes the string name of the file. You don't have to have the file already opened. And it fills in a struct stat uh, by a reference uh, pass there with an address. You know, I got tired of struct stat. It's so very 1970s C that um, I took uh, two of the Unix structs that we're going to use, struct stat and another one, struct durent, we'll get to in a bit. And I made type defs for them, so I could just call them literally stats and durentry. But they're just synonyms for the struct stat and struct durent. Having then filled in the metadata for the file we're supposed to list, we're going to test to see if it is a regular file or a directory. Now, recall that the st mode field of the fstat or the, the struct stat uh, gives you a bit pattern indicating uh, permissions, read, write, and execute. It also, however, has bits indicating whether the file is a directory or not. And you could test that by hand uh, with an appropriate bit masking and all, but uh, it gets tedious. And instead, the Unix include files provide you with a macro s underscore is reg, which will do the bit checking for you if you pass it the, uh, the mode bits. And it would turn true if the file is not a directory, but a normal file. 
In that case, we will call writeStats. WriteStats actually prints out either just the file name or a long listing with all of the bit flags and all the RWX stuff. Um, and you pass it, once again, the indent and the file name. And then either the file struct stat with metadata or a null, depending on whether or not a full listing was wanted. So it'll expect that uh, as its third parameter. Now we can get into the directory traversal in a bit. That is the remainder of uh, list, but you know, let's go up and look at write stats first, just to get a sense of how we're printing out even one of these LS lines with all its stuff on it. So here's write stats. Now, stats, recall, was going to be null if a one name only listing is all we want without the uh, long listing. And, you know, that's the easy one. Uh, so right there, if not stats, if it's null, then just print the name and we're done. Um, the rest of it is going to take a little more, though, obviously. And all the rest of this is devoted to uh, printing out a line like that. So apparently we're going to need to have this RW whatever flag thing. And then a user's name, an owner's name. Uh, in this example, I own uh, the files in question. Uh, and then uh, a group name as well. And recall from our discussions on permissions that uh, there are such things as user groups and that a file may have permissions related to its group that owns it. Uh, a size, evidently, uh, date of last modification, uh, and then finally at the very end, the file name. So we've got a grand total of one, two, three, four, five, six things to print. And all sorts of investigation on how to get usernames out of Unix and so forth. By the way, before we do proceed, um, What's line 39 about? That's actually a, a good little kind of tour de force of printf. And um, if you've done the uh, lecture on uh, the standard AO library, you should actually know already how that works. But think it through. And as an, I guess it's question number three in lecture, uh, please uh, tell me what the heck I'm doing there. Coming back from a pause, um, the answer is that this star notation uh, means that you uh, are printing in a field uh, a string within a field uh, of whatever size is given by one of the command line arguments. So indent is actually the field size here. And then the string itself is a nothing. So what this does in effect is prints as many spaces uh, as are indicated by indent to fill in that field. It's a quick and easy way to do an indent of a varying length. Okay. So let's see here, the else. Now, one of the first and most complicated things we've got to do is build that RWX string. And to help with that, I have a modester that I set up and a related type mode care. So let's take a look at what that's about. I have a mode care that describes, and I suppose I can add comments while we're at it here just to help out. This is the uh, flag is the mode bit flag to check in ST mode. This is the index is the offset within the long listing string uh, that uh, corresponds to that. So for example, if the mode bit in question is that for readability by user, the R right there, then that'll be the bit we check for, perhaps, and its index would be uh, number one within a string that begins at the dash here and ends there. Uh, of course, the dash being index number zero. And that dash, by the way, will be used, uh, that index zero will be used for the directory uh, marker. So we have a string here of, as it turns out, 10 letters, uh, index zero through nine, and we're going to have entries for each of those with the index at which they correspond, indicated by this uh, second field. And then the third field is the letter to put there. If the bit is true. I'm going to set up a array of these, a little table, mode curves, filled in with values for each of the possible bits I'd like to test of all 10 of those. And there are constants, again, supplied by the, the Unix system for the masks for each bit. So the mask for the bit that indicates that the user may read is the s underscore ir user mask. Um, to be sure you understand that, 
a question in lecture, in lecture question four. What would that be in octal exactly? What do you expect SIR user to be defined to as an octal value, uh, given what I just said? Coming back from a pause, um, it would be um, an 0400, uh, one bit in the readability for user position. Now, if I'm going to mark that in my long listing, it'll be at index 1 in the string, as we were just discussing, and I'll put an R there. And then likewise, for the writability by user, that'll be at index 2 in the string, and I'll stick a W there if that bit is turned on. And you can read through the rest of these and see what's going on. Here are the ones for the group. Here are the ones for other. There are, however, three of them that are not at all obvious. Well, not entirely unobvious, but uh, one of them you can guess. What the heck is that for, based on what I said just a few minutes ago? That's an in-lecture question. Coming back from a pause there. Well, it's apparently at offset zero in the string, and it's going to put a D in there, and what it's doing is testing for the, is this a directory flag? That's one of the flags in ST mode, a flag a bit indicating whether or not the file is a directory. But what about these two? And here again, along the way, is an opportunity to discuss a Unix concept. Apparently, there is a bit for user ID and set, actually, that should be set user ID, SUID, and set group ID. And we need a digression to talk about these, but first notice where they are positioned. Three. Well, isn't that the same as the position for executability by user? And so what we're saying here, I guess, is if this bit is set, we're going to make an S instead of an X at that location. So we'll look in our lec next lecture segment at just what that entails and then get back to write stats and the rest of the uh, Alt-LS function uh, or program.